what I'm going to talk about today is a poem which is referred to, which is uh, appears in the Book of Leinster, uh, which is uh, includes a collection of genealogies amongst various other um, other things. Um, it's from the 12th century, what commenced about 1152, um, but including included as well as genealogies of saints and and um, and holy people are additional material. Um, such as various poems, and it's uh, one of these poems I'm going to be looking at today. Um, I should have said that this is, and um, this is my sort of American talk show style uh, plug at the minute, this is uh, all taken from work I did in my book, which came out a few months ago, um, which is itself based on uh, my PhD thesis. So what I'm going to talk to you today is all focused really on what one of the chapters in this book looks at. Although, uh, given the time limits, um, I'm going to be really skimming the surface with all of these, all of the people who are discussed in the poem. But this poem, it's I've called it Seven Brothers. It features the adventures of seven supposed brothers who travel, apparently from Scotland, over the sea to Ireland. And it's quite fascinating when uh, we look at it, because it seems to be bringing together seven individuals who may be Pictish, who were remembered for having travelled to Ireland and having been resident in Ireland. And um, what I'm trying to do today is hopefully get to the bottom of if we can get to, if we can find, see any real people who lie behind these uh, brothers who are portrayed in the tale. But I'm going to start off by showing you the poem, and this is uh, based on the translation by Davy O'Cronin. The poem begins with the little uh, note at the top, Column Kill sang it, and then goes on to say, The seven beautiful sons of Angus, they went to the land of Ireland, Motrianog and Ethernisk, Johannan of the beautiful coursing, Motrianog was received at Ruskak amongst the Ifalge. Johannan was at Kendlekeg and the famous Ethernisk at Clane. The four whom they left behind went across the steady sea, Turanan and Agatan, Mochulian and Troscan. Troscan the strong settled at Ardbracken with melodiousness. Turanan the gen generous settled above the hosts of Tullochstini. Mochulian was in Dresnatha in the territory of the Fothert Fia, the great pride. Agatan was in his little hermitage on the banks of the cold Inne. The four complete warriors found a noble grant from the High King of the Fair Halidoms that they should all die on the same day. On the day preceding the Nones of June, that's the 4th of June, a Thursday, the four complete warriors passed from the right judging life by the will of the fair Son of God. The flagstone on which they came over the storm-swelled sea, it was Agaton, the youngest of them, who won it in a lot casting amongst the four. The monasteries that they received, and in which they did their great deeds, they are now amongst the Enail, with the grace of the sevenfold spirit. So, quite a lengthy poem there, but it's an absolute goldmine when trying to tease out details of traditions, at least, of people who had sailed from Northern Britain to Ireland in the early medieval period. So, as the poem says, it links them together as brothers um, of, of an Angus. Uh, any literal fraternal in relationship is exceptionally unlikely. But beyond that, it groups four specifically together. And it says that four of them were said to have travelled on the same day, um, on the same flagstone, as you do, and uh, died on the same day as well. So there's four that are closely, even more closely than, than just their brotherhood linked together. And then there's the three odd saints out. And um, Thomas Clancy observed that at least some of the men are likely to have been Pictish. And uh, as we'll see, there is a very good reason for suspecting that um, with quite a number of them. So furthermore, the locations, as we'll see, that the poet, at least, uh, who compiled, compiled this, uh, this poem, um, attributed to the men all seem to be in the Meath-Leinster area. 
Um, so as we'll see there, it seems to be trying to plot these men out in that area of the sort of middle eastern part of Ireland and um, trying to express and linking all of these men together as people who travelled from Scotland to Ireland. So what I'm going to do today is go through these brothers in turn, um, and we can certainly say more about some than of others, and consider the evidence for any historical person lying behind the, the characters in the poem, and then also try to consider why this poem might have been composed, and um, what reasons might there have been for the poet to come up with this scheme linking these seven men together. So, to begin uh, with the first of the brothers that we'll consider, Toranan. So, the poem um, lists Toranan as one of the four who travelled together. And um, I'm intending to start off with these four and then we can look at the odd ones out afterwards. And if we look again at what the poem says, uh, Toranan the Generous settled above the hosts of Tullach Tinni. And Tullach Tinni has argued to be likely to be um, located on the Brosna or Silver Rivers, um, which on this map is F. Um, I've realised that uh, when I've been putting this together, actually, the, uh, the key rather unhelpfully goes backwards rather than forwards in the way I'm going to talk about this. But uh, hopefully that's fine. Um, but uh, if you look at F there, the blue rivers there, that is the location that the poet seems to ascribe to Toranan. If we look at Irish sources, we do find rather early mentions of Toranan in the martyrologies. So uh, the martyrology of Tala, which dates from the early 9th century, uh, commemorates on the 12th of June, uh, Taranan, um, abbot of Benker. And that seems to be potentially bankery in Aberdeenshire. And uh, that identification can be, I suppose, argued further. When we look at the, the near contemporary martyrology of Angus um, from the early 9th century again, who on the same date commemorates Tyrannan lasting deedful over the wide ship abounding sea. So there's clearly, at least as early as the 9th century, a tradition that this man travelled across the sea uh, to Ireland. The uh, later notes in some of the versions of the martyrologies um, go into more detail. Now, bear in mind that this is a, these are these are much later. Sometimes they're quite hard to date, but we're not talking uh, early medieval at all here with these notes. Um, but they add a little bit of extra information um, to Tyrannan, um, and it says that is Palladius, who was sent by Peter's successor into Ireland before Patrick to teach them. And then it goes on to explain why several several specific words are used. Um, now that's interesting because that is a gloss in a manuscript, and the same a similar gloss appears in a couple of different surviving manuscripts, which asserts that Toranan is the same as Palladius, Edest or Edon, I should say, um, Palladius. Uh, it says there. Now, as we'll see, it's much more likely that uh, Toranan originally was simply equated with Palladius perhaps as a disciple, or as we'll see probably more likely, um, given that he was almost certainly much, much later than Palladius, um, somebody who might have been significantly associated with Palladius' cult. But I'm just drawing attention at the moment, um, for reasons that will become clear later, to the fact that this particular manuscript, um, the so-called Franciscan A7 manuscript, says that Torano is Palladius. So, what we can draw from the Irish sources is that Toranan was associated with travel from Northern Britain to Ireland, and he was associated with Palladius. And sorry, I should have clarified there that Palladius is the earliest named Christian in Ireland, um, predating Patrick, although from the context in which he's named, it's quite clear that he wasn't regarded as being the first Christian in Ireland, but he was largely regarded as having been unsuccessful um, in later in, in his missionary activities, at least by later sources. So what about Scotland then? 
And if we look at mainland Scotland, there seem to be rather significant number of potential um, links to this plan in the northeast. So um, Bankery, um, otherwise known as Bankery Ternan, is uh, associated with Torunan at least as early as 1200, when the first reference to Bankery Ternan occurs. There was a Saint or Ternan's Fair in Bankery. Um, to be honest, I don't know if it still continues, but certainly right up until um, the 19th century, uh, when the, there was a great um, survey commissioned by the the government of, of markets and fairs in Scotland. Um, and interestingly, considering the link with Palladius, uh, there was also a Paldi Fair in July in Bank Bankery. That seems to, to suggest that these uh, these two names were equated there. Um, if we look at uh, nearby Forden, there's St Palladius's Chapel, and there's also a Paldi Well as well. And interestingly, um, if we look at Forden, the class two simple stone, which has a um, Roman inscription, uh, sorry, a Roman alphabetic inscription in the top left. Um, a lot of it's hard to make out, but what you can see is, um, you can just make it on a poll, sorry for the uh, rather faint old photo there, but in the top left hand side, there is script that says, the first letter is reasonably indeterminate, but then, reasonably easy to make out Idarnon. Um, so arguably this could be an inscription um, to Tarnon, um, Ternan, Taranan. Um, so interestingly that this occurs in Forden, where as we've seen there's plenty of dedications to or evidence for dedications to Palladius. So when we move on into the Middle Ages in the Scottish sources and into kind of late medieval Scottish sources. Uh, John of Forden uh, himself says that uh, the holy bishop Taranen likewise was a disciple of the blessed Palladius, who was his godfather and his fosterling teacher and furtherer of all the rudiments and letters of, of the faith. And um, likewise, the Aberdeen Breviary, uh, published 1510, says that Ternan was a disciple of Palladius uh, and mentions that twice actually, both in its account of Palladius and its account of Ternan. Now, uh, Thomas Clancy has argued that a plausible reason for this apparent link in the sources might be that, uh, that uh, perhaps Ternan was associated with bringing the rel relics of Palladius to Bankery, but there certainly seems to have been an equation between the two saints. Now, there's a rather interesting outlier. Um, most of, as we've seen, the Scottish dedications to Ternan occur in the Northeast. But there does seem to be a cluster in Western Isles, uh, which is interesting. And um, if it was a remnant of uh, a memory of, of the activities of, of uh, Turanan, it would be quite significant because it would, it would be a good piece of evidence for continuity of Christian practice from previous to Norse settlement to the Middle Ages and indeed beyond into modern times, and it has actually been used in that way. Um, place names such as Tarinzi, um, where there's an Ecclesi Taran, so a, a church of, of Taran, and also a Kla Taran, a, a, a graveyard um, associated with this name, Taran. Um, interestingly, uh, the earliest attestations of this graveyard say only women are buried in this particular graveyard. And it has often been assumed that these are referencing Taranen. And um, that is in no small part down to the fact that when Alexander Carmichael uh, collected various pieces of folklore and, and old tales um, from the Western Isles, he obtained this information, which is apparently a narrative of St. Taranen that was said to be current in Uist. The Pope sent Taranen to teach the people of Ireland the way of salvation, but the people of Ireland would not receive Taranen, who they beat and maltreated in various ways. Taranen prayed to, God, prayed to God to deliver him from the Irish and shook the dust off his feet. He betook himself and his coracle and turned it sunwise in the name of God, in the name of Christ, and in the name of the Spirit, 
praying to the Holy Three to send him when and where and whichever way they listed and had work for him to do, but not again to Ireland. The man was driven about hither and thither on the wild waves in his frail coracle. No one knows how long or how far, but an eye was on his prow and a hand was on it at the helm, and the tide and the wind and the waves combined to take him into the little creek of Caligio in Bimbecula. So quite a vivid image there, and um, would seem to suggest that, yes, indeed, these Taran place names in the, in the Western Isles are reflective of Taranan. However, this story almost fits a little too neatly. Um, you remember that Taranan is linked in tradition to Palladius. Here is Murahu's um, narrative of Palladius. So Murahu writing in the, the late 7th century, when he talked about Palladius, no mention at all of Taranan here, Murahu says, he knew for certain that Palladius, Archdeacon of Pope Celestine, the Bishop of Rome, who was then occupying the Apostolic See as the 45th successor to St. Peter the Apostle, had been consecrated and sent to this island in the cold north in order to convert it. But he was prevented from doing so by the fact that nobody can receive anything from the earth unless it be given from heaven. Neither were these wild and harsh men inclined to accept his teaching, nor did he himself wish to spend a long time in a foreign country, but decided to return to him who had first sent him. On his way back from here, having crossed the first sea and begun his journey by land, he ended his life in the territory of the Britons. Now, that to me sounds suspiciously similar to this narrative of Taranen that uh, Alexander Carmichael picked up at the very start of the very end, uh, very end of the 19th century. And um, far too suspiciously similar for this to have been handed down from pre-Norse times in the Western Isles. Um, but if that's the case, where on earth did this get, how on earth did this get here? And, and why was there, um, why is a story that is attributed to Palladius in most Irish sources, basically exactly the same, but attributed to Taranan in this story, um, told orally, uh, in the Western Isles in recent times? Well, I think we possibly have the culprits in the form of the Franciscans. So the Franciscans, um, who were based in the St. Anthony's College in Leuven, sent a mission to the Hebrides in order to re-evangelise re or reassert Catholicism uh, from 1619. Now, these Franciscans in Leuven just so happened to be the owners at the time of the manuscript I showed you earlier, which says in a note that Toranan is the same as Palladius. So my suspicion would be that what's happened, they've gone to the Western Isles, they've seen Taran place names in the landscape, they've assumed, ah, we know about him, because they know about um, that Taranan is the same name as Palladius, and knowing from the old Irish sources that Palladius had travelled to Britain after um, his rejection in Ireland, or supposed rejection in Ireland, inferred that the Western Isles was what he, where he got and filled in the gaps. That's my suspicion. Um, I just think that it's, it's, it fits rather too neatly for it to be a genuine tradition of Turanan going back over, over a millennia. So, what can we say about Turanan? Um, I have to say, um, don't worry, not all of the Seven Brothers are this lengthy. Um, we just happen to have more about him than some of the other ones. Um, the evidence points to a historical Toranan, um, and you, you'll notice I'm not being entirely, um, I'm not being entirely uh, consistent with my pronunciation, um, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected one way or the other, whether it's Toranan or, but I think Toranan probably because of the emphasis there. Um, was an influential figure in both Ireland and Northeast Scotland. He was regarded at least as early as the ninth century as being a traveler from the sea, from across the sea to Ireland. But I would argue that there's little historical evidence for his historical 
activity or any early cult in the Western Isles. And I would say that it's very likely that this cult in the Western Isles is actually much likely a much later phenomenon, which was introduced by the Franciscans. That obviously leaves history um, because the, no idea who this Taran in the Hebridean place names actually is. I mean, Taran is an attested Pictish name, so it's, it's uh, certainly certainly possible that they're named after a person. Um, but I would say that we can say with reasonable confidence that it's not unlikely that a Toranan from the northeast of Scotland may have travelled to Ireland and been active in both places. So moving on, Troskin, otherwise known as Drosten. Well, the poem says that he settled in Ardbracken, uh, which is in Meath, so E there on the map. So in this sort of northern northern part of Leinster. And um, there's a very, very good fit in the Irish Annals um, for him. So we have Drosten of Darty rested in Ardbracken. Um, Irish Annals are very, very good at um, increasing the euphemistic way they say die with the more holy somebody is. So if, if they rested, they were a really good person. Um, but uh, he was, uh, so yes, he rested in Ardbracken and um, he was called Dostin, uh, Drosten of Darteg and it's been suggested that perhaps Darteg might be deer. Um, we know that devotion to Drosten at deer is at least as early as the um, origin account of deer in which Drosten features prominently. So that's from the late 11th or early, twi or early 12th century Gallic notes uh, that are in the Book of Deer. Also, um, slightly or quite a bit further south, um, but uh, we have the Drosten Stone. Now that doesn't necessarily tell us anything other than it was a, a, testable, uh, a testable name, but it is, a, it is possible that it commemorates uh, St. Drosten, um, it, alongside two other men, uh, Vorit and Fergus. But it is interesting, as we'll see, that two of those three names are Drosten and Fergus. Now, Drosten has quite a lot of feasts associated with him in various different sources, and uh, they show, I suppose, how popular a saint he was and how many uh, different other saints, cults he got intertwined with over time. Uh, so some of the later Irish calendars list him on the either the 4th or sometimes due to scribal errors, the 12th of June, uh, which seems to be linked in order to link him with Torinan. Um, none of the none of the other uh, of the four brothers who travelled together other than Torinan have a 4th of June feast in the earliest, in the earliest uh, meteorologies. There seems to be some confusion of traditions related to Drosten and St. Benedict at Deer, um, accounts of when various festivals were, um, were celebrated and who they were commemorating seem to have got a bit, a bit mixed up there. And uh, I think for that reason, um, Drosten acquired the 11th of July as a feast day, which is the day before, I think, um, or the eve of, I should say, the... Um, Feast of the Translation of the Relics, uh, the Relics of St. Benedict. And, and because of that association at Deer, he seems to have acquired July Feast. He also acquired a December Feast, and that's likely to be due to confusion with St. Drusus of Antioch. Um, not a well-known saint at all, but one who does appear in some of the earliest Irish annals. And in November, he's got a feast on the 19th of November which is interesting because he is closely associated with St. Fergus, who has a feast on the 18th of November. So who is St. Fergus? Fergus is another interesting character. He's not named in the poem that we're looking at, but it's very relevant because he is attested in a council of, in Rome in 71 as Fergus the Pict, Bishop in Ireland, or Bishop of the Irish which is interesting. So we seem to have a Pictish bishop active in Ireland. He appears, interestingly, in Rome alongside uh, Sedulius, Bishop of the Britons, 
of the race of the Irish. So it, it's 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 rather interesting there. We seem to have a, we seem to have a pair. One of them's a, a Pict who's a bishop of the Irish, and one of them's a, a, a an Irishman who's a bishop in Britain. But anyway, so Fergus, we know at least one historical Fergus in the clergy was a Pictish a Pictish um, bishop active in Ireland. Um, Martyrology of Tala celebrates in September Fergus the Pict. But in addition to the coincidence of the dates in November um, between this commemoration of St. Jostin and St. Uh, Fergus, there's also quite heavy coincidence of uh, markets and fair days in Caithness. So um, the fourth Tuesday of November in Ulrich was St. Trother Miss Fair, seems to commemorate um, Trothman, Troskin, Drosten. And the fourth Tuesday of November in Wick was the Fergus Miss Fair. And if we look at a map plotting the commemorations to Drosten and Fergus um, in um, church dedications, place names and, uh, and fairs, it's rather striking. There is There seems to be a correlation of the cults sort of in northeast Scotland and Caithness. And um, that begs the question, of course, as, uh, as, as which, why and, uh, and in which way were, were this, was this association of cults introduced? Did it um, begin in the northeast of Scotland and get moved to Caithness in, in, in one? Or did it begin in Caithness and move to the northeast? So wrapping up Drosten or Troskin, what we can say is there's widespread commemorations of Drosten in the northeast of Scotland and Caithness. He seems to be associated often with Fergus, who himself was a Pict resident in Ireland. And uh, I mean, obviously, we can't say anything beyond whether that whether these two men might have actually been in any way associated in real life. Incidentally, if they were, Fergus's appearance at the council in Rome appears, I think it was uh, about 20 years after Drosten's death, so they, they might have been different generations, but um, that's certainly not impossible they would have had an association in real life, but uh, you can very much see why, even if not, content or people um, after the deaths might have associated them if they both had similar careers, and it's at least possible that the Troskin who died at Arbracken in Meath was Drosten of Deer, so there does seem to be quite a possibility um, as with all of these men, nothing is certain, but seems there's a, a strong possibility that with Drosten we do have a genuine Pictish man active in Ireland. The next of the four who grouped together, and you'll be pleased to note that this is a much, much shorter one, Mohulian. So in the poem, he's associated with Drisnatha in the territory of the Father Tefia. And uh, that's been identified as Carlo, so down um, labelled G on the map there, down in the southern end, the southernmost one of the locations that have been identified. There's a handful of other references to saints named Mohulian in Irish sources. Um, I should say here that this Mo prefix, which you get quite often in uh, saints' names, is uh, it's been described as an almost respectful hypochorism. So it's like it's almost like it's my Julian. It's a it's a respectful um, prefix that's put in front of a, a saint's name, but does show a very kind of close devotion. So um, quite often it's found in the commemoration of saints. But it's also quite possible that some of the some like ultimately the person lying behind some of these commemorations is Columba, uh, Colob Kill. So, and a very little can be concluded with any certainty about any historical individual behind this this name. Um, so there's really there's really not very much we can say about Mahulian at all. Um, similarly, Agatan, the other one of the four. The poem says he was in the Hermitage on the banks of the cold any. Now, that's really all we know about Agatan, the very little at all in terms of attestations of any cults or, or commemorations. But the location in itself is, is rather interesting. Um, the River Inney, which uh, flows through Meath, 
Cavan, Longford, and, and Westmead. Because Davy O'Cronin has pointed out that the any marks the traditional boundary line between the Enail, slightly to the north and west of this, and Leinster, to the south. At least traditionally, um, these uh, these uh, Irish political boundaries throughout the Middle Ages were so fluid and so uh, so um, uncertain that it, you, you 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 certainly can't. Um, neatly draw lines, but there were certain certain um, certain features that were regarded almost um in a kind of almost literary way as being being points that marked boundaries. Um this is a very oversimplified map, but I think just quite a good one to just illustrate roughly where the E nail traditionally were located as compared to the Lagan or the Leinster. And so it's just rather interesting that really sort of at the fringes of that Enail territory, um, where you would think would be the sort of southern boundary of the e, of the Enail, that's the northernmost point really in any of these po any of the poems, uh, any of the locations mentioned in the poem. And um, as we'll see later, that may be rather significant. You may remember that the poem asserts that all of these are in the territory of the Enail, and yet the one that seems to be most in the fringe really is the only one that should be touching email territory. So I'll move on now to three odd saints out. So we've we've covered the four who travelled together. Two of them have quite good claims to be Picts who were resident and active in Ireland. Um, potentially also after quite an active career in Scotland. Um, Two of them we can't say so much about. The next of the of the first of the odd saints out we'll look at is Eternisk, um, described as the famous Eternisk at Clean, and uh, that is fairly certainly uh, Clean County Dil Kildare, uh, marked with the D there on your map, and we can see that. Uh, the cult of Ethernisk at Clean seems to have very early origins. Um, so the martyrology of Tala commemorates uh, Ethernisk of Clean. Um, Tua MH Roida is the same, and Alton Tiggy Tua, um, that seems to be a different person. And then it goes on um, rather vaguely as to whether it's referring to Ethernisk or Alton Tiggy Tua, but saying that he's called Tua, which means silent. Um, because he used to hold a stone in his lips for all the time of Lent, so that he was not able to speak. As a consequence, he is called to it. So there is a this. Um, there seems to be um, a reference to a vow of silence there, um, even if that uh, if that later description is referring to Alton Tiggy to it. Um, we can see here that uh, that Martyrology of Tala does seem to be saying that uh, another name for Ethernisk of Clean is um, to it. What about in Scotland? Well, there's a clear connection to somebody called Ethernisk in the register of um, the Priory of the Cathedral Church of St Andrews, which records the consecration of the chapel at Lothrisk in Fife in 1243. And that says, also in the same year, on the fifth day before the calends of August, the Church of St John the Evangelist on St Ethernisk's, the confessor, at Lothrisk was dedicated by the same bishop. So that um, certainly tells us that in Fife, we seem to have a cult of uh, a, a saint called Ethernisk. But that raises a question as to whether Ethernisk is the same as a name that appears far more frequently in relation to um, commemoration of a saint in the northeast of Scotland, and that's Ethernan. Now, Ethernan is attested as a as a name in in uh, the Annals of Ulster uh, in association with the Picts, and um, we've got Ethernan and Corindy died amongst the Picts. We have no other context, so we really don't know who that is referring to at all. Um, we can't really draw anything more more from that. But if we look at um, church dedications um, from slightly well, later medieval records, we have a uh, Kilrenny in Fife. Um, recorded as Kilrethne 
in the mid 12th century. And that's opposite the Isle of May, where there is a long attested cult of an Ethernet. Um, there's a grant by Alexander Common, the Earl of Buchan, uh, who died in 1289, for the light of St. Etherman of the Isle of May, uh, which, which is rather, rather interesting. And I, I'm, also, I'm interested to speculate on exactly what the light is referring to there. Um, Luminarian, it says, uh, it says in, the, in, the, in the Latin, whether that's some early form of lighthouse or probably more plausibly, a light associated with, with a shrine. Um, in any case, Ethernan actually becomes associated in his name with the name Adrian. Um, so, uh, so Saint Adrian is today possibly more more well known and in association with the Isle of May. But it does seem that, um, as Macquarie puts it, Adrian is a Latin realization of Ethernan at the Isle of May. So. There are various inscriptions as well, uh, which seem to attest somebody called Ethernan, um, which may of course be commemorations, although we can't be entirely sure. Um, so um, for example, there's ones at Scooney in Fife, uh, as well as further north at uh, Brodie in Murray. There is a note of caution though, uh, in that Ethernan, as we've seen, is a very similar name to Ternan, um, Teranan. So, we can't necessarily point to point to them and say, ah, that is definitely Ethern and that is definitely Tern. And there may well be some conflation of cults, and it's worth worth pointing out that those names are rather similar. Um, Northeastern connections are attested in the Aberdeen Breviary um, from the early 16th century, but uh, claiming that Ethernan was Bishop of Rathen and Buchan, and um, St. Ethernan's Fair was held in Forfar. On the 2nd of December. Now, all of that, so we seem to have clusters in the northeast, we seem to have clusters in Fife. There is one piece of evidence that would suggest that these may well be linked, and that's if we look back here, we can see that the this light of St. Etherman on the Isle of May is granted by the Earl of Buchan. So whether it's him that introduced the cult to the northeast or him that introduced the cult to Fife, um, or maybe neither. But it's it's just interesting that there is that link between these five clusters and these more northeasterly clusters of uh, of devotion to Ethernet. So, to conclude with this brother Ethernisk, there's very early links between Ethernisk and Clean, the location in the poem. There is significant evidence for Scottish commemorations of someone with similar names, or someone or a group of individuals with similar names. However, it's impossible to prove that any of these are the same man as commemorated in the poem. However, what it does demonstrate, at least, is that Ethernisk is at least a plausible name for a Pictish migrant within the church, as the poem seems to be depicting. Moving on to the next of the odd saints out, Johannan. And uh, we've got a little more substance that we seem to be, that we can put together with Johannan. Um, first of all, the location, as mentioned in the poem, uh, is given as Kendleke, uh, and that has been argued on the basis of um, the, uh, the geographic center of most of the, the uh, the men in the poem, to have been Laka in Kildare. And that kind of location, firmly in Leinster, would lend itself, would fit quite nicely with an anecdote that we have in Adverin's Life of St Columba, which was written roughly 700. And this, I think, gives a, a fascinating insight into the movement of people within in the church. At another time, a book of hymns for the week, written in the hand of St. Columba, fell from the shoulders of a boy who had slipped from a bridge, and, with the skin satchel that contained it, was submerged in a certain river in the region of the Lagan, that means Leinster. This book remained in the water from the Lord's Nativity until the days of Easter were concluded, and after that, found on the river bank by some women who were walking there. It was carried to a certain priest, Johanna, a Pict by race, 
to whom it formerly belonged. In the same satchel, which was not only sodden, but even rotten, when Johanna opened the satchel, he found his book undamaged and as clean and dry as if it had remained all that time in a coffer and had never fallen into the water. So not one of Comba's most dramatic miracles, but a, a, a nice insight into monastic life, but also fascinating because there we have a Pict called Johannan, who is a priest living in Ireland, in Leinster. And that's um, there's a tradition associated with him attested as early as Aberdeen's life of St. Columba. Now, given that um, this is... There's no time stamp in this, as it were, um, because it's not even explicitly said that this happened during the lifetime of Columba. This could have been somebody who was well known as reasonably contemporary, or at least e near contemporary with, with Adarnan. And, and it does show that uh, there is a tradition of a Johannan who was a Pict in Leinster this um, rather early on. But there's a little problem with the identification of Ken Lekig as being Ken Lekig or Lekki in Laka in uh, Leinster. If we look at the Martyrology of Tala, so another early source, um, early 9th century, we have the commemoration of Johannan, son of Angus, in Ard Lekig and my N. Now that my N is well, like the plain of N, which lies between the rivers Ern and Drowse in the far south of Donegal. And there is a place called Lake, or Lekeg, or Laka, attested in this location. Um, now, Laka is an incredibly common Irish name. It just means essentially flat, stony place, but um, or um, place filled with flat stones. But uh, the quarter of Killer Laka is attested there in 1623. So we have the situation where the Martyrology of Tala commemorates uh, Yoenon, son of Angus, apparently in Donegal, in a place called Ardlechig. And we have Adamnan attesting a Pictish priest in Leinster called Yoenon. Has the comp compiler of the poem, knowing about the life of St. Columba anecdote, seen a reference to a different Joanna associated with a place called Ardlechig and misidentified that as a more local lacquer. It seems possible, but it does seem um, it does seem that we might be looking at two different men called Joanna here, who the, the poet may have tied together in error. So to conclude with Joanna, we can say that at least as early as 700, when the life, the, the life of St. Columba was written, there were accounts of a Pictish priest by this name who lived in Leinster. And it seems likely that the seven, the author of the poem, Seven Brothers, would have known this and misidentified the lacquer associated with a probably different Yonan with a more local location called Laka. And um, as I've said, Laka's locations are not hard to find in Ireland. So turning now, um, you'll be relieved to hear to the final one of the saints, the last of the odd saints out, Motrianog. So this is another one of these uh, these Mo names. Um, this time his name is coupled with Og at the end. That quite often happens as well. Um, so Motrianog, otherwise they're Trianon or something along those lines. He was received at Ruska amongst the Efalds. Um, essentially awfully is what that means there. Um, so the poem seems to explicitly say that he is from uh, Rusa in Offaly, uh, which is labelled A in this map here. So that's a, that's a fairly clear identification um, from the poet. There seem to be there seems to be the possibility that the poet has merged two different Motrinogs, at least two different Motrinogs. Um, the Martyrology of Tala commemorates what seem to be two separate saints by this name. On the 20th of August, it um, commemorates Motrinog of Ruska. And on the 2nd of February, it commemorates Motrinog, son of Angus. And yet the poem commemorates a Motrinog, son of Angus, at Ruska. 
Now, the poet, in bringing these two together, seems to have assumed that this was Ruska in, or Rusa in Offaly, um, and the poet says so explicitly, as we've seen. However, if we look at the Martyrology of Tala, we can see that that, work, that, uh, that entry does not specify where this Ruska is. And this may be another case of misidentification. It's also been suggested that um, a Motrianog or a Trinanus is associated with Cooley in Louth. And uh, there is a Ruska in Cooley in Louth. Adavnin's Life of St. Columba makes reference to on a certain day, the blessed man ordered one of his monks called Trenin of the family Mokuruntir to go to Ireland as an emissary. So here's Adamin's Life of Columba giving us another account of somebody who has gone physically from Scotland to Ireland, albeit in this occasion, this is an Irishman originally, resident in Scotland, who has travelled to Ireland. Now the Dalruntir, who are the family that is stated to be of this, the name of this Trenin, were located in Eastern Louth. So it does seem that there is, is the possibility that the Martyrology of Tala is commemorating a Motrianog or a Trenin of Louth and the compiler of the poet, as well as conflating another Motrianog son of Angus and bringing them together and bringing this Motrianog in, has misidentified the location as a more local location, again, of a similar name. There is, however, another more local um, to Leinster Saint by a similar name. And um, that is at Trenin Dru Evgan, who is referred to in the genealogist. So again, that's another, another Trenin name. And he is associated, as you can see there, with a place um, called Evgan in the genealogies. And it has been suggested that this might be Rath Evgan, Rathangan, and Kildare, which is marked with a B there, which is strikingly close to the locations that we've looked at already associated with Ioannin. And actually, oh, sorry. Uh, Trying to move this and um, number C or letter C, as well as Ethernisk, the other location as uh, the so the location associated with uh, sorry clean the location associated with Ethernisk in D. So you seem to have there with this other trainer a commemoration that is attested or a location attested with each of the odd saints out in a reasonably small geographical area, um, C, uh, B, C and D on that map. So I'll talk a bit about that in a second, but to wrap up Matrianog, the life of Columba clearly attests an early tradition of someone of a similar name, Trenin, being sent from Scotland to Ireland as an emissary, despite the fact he was originally Irish. So again, we have the life of Columba kind of clearly asserting um, that direction of travel surrounding an individual. There seems to be traditions surrounding multiple churchmen of a similar name in Ireland, but that includes one that was strikingly close to other places um, that were associated with the two other uh, the two odd saints out in the point, um, Johannin and Ethernisk. So the poet seems to have merged two or more of these men with a name like Matrianog or Trenin into one, possibly misidentifying the location of Ruska in the process. So that is the whistle stop tour of the Seven Brothers. So just to wrap up, it's worth considering why and how did, did the poet, whoever they were, compose this poem? Well, I would argue that it's possibly likely that given the proximity of 
cults or at least the dedications associated with the three odd saints out, it's likely that it was composed perhaps in or near Clane in the first place. Names are similar to the three odd saints out are commemorated in that very small area. At least two of these saints, Johannan and Montrianog, have names that are very similar to people who are explicitly associated with travel in, from Scotland to Ireland in Otherman's Life of St. Columba. And the third, Eternisk, has a name that was associated with early cults in Scotland, so may well have been, um, although we can't say for certain, associated with travel from Scotland to Ireland. Perhaps what happened was these three, known locally, inspired the poet to come up with this theme um, of travel from Scotland to Ireland um, as a theme for the poet. The four who are said specifically to travel together seem to be much more widely spaced, and actually, if anything, quite dramatically so. They almost seem to mark out quite a significant expanse of territory. Now, is that deliberate? So if we look at E, H, F, and G there, around there, so the, the two uh, sort of pin points that are in blue and the two river boundaries that are in blue that are associated with the four that are grouped together, that does seem to be marking out a specific, a very significant expanse of territory. And interestingly, the poem, as we've seen, specifically states that these monasteries are in under control of the e -nail, despite the fact that it's the one at the extreme northeast, H, traditionally should be the extreme southwest boundary of the e -nail. So is this poet trying to assert perhaps a very dubious claim, for whatever reason, that e -nail control is now being um, applied over a significant amount of Leinster territory. So that was an incredibly uh, quick whistle-stop tour through seven churchmen and, uh, well, more than seven churchmen, all of the confusing uh, doppelgangers and misidentifications that have been associated with them through the years. Um, so yes, as I said, it was very much skimming the surface over um, the evidence that exists for all of them. Um, I hope I've demonstrated that what this poem does do, regardless of um, the motivations shaping it, is alert us to the fact that it was very possible for somebody to write a poem that brought together churchmen from Northern Britain who were active in Ireland. There seems very, very good grounds to suggest that a lot of these characters may indeed have uh, historical migrants lying behind them. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Yashin. That was um, fascinating. Uh, I, an amazing bit of detective work. I think what you've certainly made me realise is that poets are very unreliable sources of all this conflation of names and misidentification of places. I think, you know, um, they should just stick with getting words to rhyme. Uh, that's that's the best thing. So if um, we have registered any questions on the um, Q&A or chat function um, that uh, David has at his command, we can go through them. But also what I'll do is I'll um, just invite anyone, if, you've, if you would prefer to pose a question via chat, then type it away and David can have a turn at reading some of those out. For Rasheen, if you would like to just ask a question, please feel free to wave your hand and I'll try and um, catch you and ask you um, uh, to unmute and speak up. Right, can we, so, shall we kick off with one from the chat, John? Do please. So, uh, I've got a comment from uh, Pamela saying, I, I bide in Anstruther or Einster and thought the name came from Atherton or Adrian. Any thoughts? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, I'd have to turn behind me and consult uh, Simon Taylor's uh, fabulous uh, volumes um, 
I, I've got one or two of them behind me just at, at home but, here with me. I'm afraid I don't know, but that would be interesting. It would be very interesting. Um, it would fit very well. I thought for a second there you had Simon Taylor in the room behind you. <laughs> no, sadly, although there was once an occasion where I had a question about historical um, place names in Scotland, and uh, which I'd raised with the, the group of people I was with. And then later that day was travelling on a train and he was there. <laughs> and able to answer my question, which was fabulous. Um, but um, sadly, uh, no, no, Simon Taylor is not present in Orkney in this house. I think, I think what we'll try and do is, for the next um, lecture, we'll try and make sure that we get Simon in somebody's room so that he can be there just to give us a quick off-the-cuff answer should a question of this sort raise itself again. Um, you have any, any more questions there to ask, David? A uh, couple of comments. One, uh, great detective work, clearly and eloquently explained. That's from Steve and uh, Dr. John Rafferty. Fascinating talk. Um, have you come across any other poems that might validate your hypothesis? Um, in terms of my hypothesis on the the merits itself of, um, or the reason that that poet was... Um, was writing uh, specifically. Uh, no, sadly. Um, and I've, I've also not come across a plausible political event or time that would really neatly fit sort of towards the end of the early medieval period or later, there was definitely an email takeover of that sort of area or, or, or overlordship, um, sadly. Um, so I, I've got suspicion it's more wishful thinking on the part of the poet than anything else, perhaps. Um, the, the only the only incidents that that could reflect are, are rather earlier than some of the the uh, the martyrologies and other source material that the poet seems to be using. Um, so I, I I think it's probably more wishful thinking than anything else. Um, in terms of the wider, um, the wider argument that there was quite an active Pictish and, and other Northern British presence in Ireland. Uh, there's plenty of literature, I think, plenty of literary sources that attest that. One of the most fascinating that is another um, real gold mine of of, um, of apparently early names of, of churchmen and women that are associated with Britain active in Ireland is in the Aditamenta, so-called, which appears in the Book of Armagh, and it's a collection of a collection of notes, really, and um, it's got a foundation account of the Church of Trim uh, in Ireland, and that uh, that includes an anecdote where um, a, a saint, the Saint Loman of Trim, and his various associates, who are who are portrayed as being Britons active in, in Ireland, encounter a family who are all originally from Britain, Britain and they name various different members. And, and there's just, there's countless um, individuals here. Now, it's harder to place them quite geographically um, as, as sort of Northern or Southern, although some of them may have been Northern. So that's that's another text that's actually really interesting for, for trying to place individuals um, in or at least a tradition that there was a heavily, um, quite a significant British presence in, in the Irish church. Another one um, I would argue that's quite interesting is a poem, a much shorter poem, which is often called The Scholars of Clonard. And that's a really interesting one because that seems to commemorate three men, um, uh, Winnie, uh, Fergus and... Aileron, and then it says, great was the present that Pictonia sent to Ireland, uh, relics that it wishes to be its own. Mm. Now that has often been translated as Poitiers, because Pictonia is a, is a, is a translation attested for Poitiers, but given that at least two of those three men, um, Fergus, who I've talked about today, um, Winnie, who sometimes, and it's still slightly controversially, um, but sometimes associated with Ninian, um, and certainly associated with, with Finian, um, seem to be either Pictish or Northern British individuals who 
travel to Ireland, I would say it's far more likely that what we have here is Pictonia is being used as a reference to Pictland. Um, and this that's another poem that is explicitly saying these people travelled from Northern Britain to Ireland. Um, and presumably that means that there's some dispute over relics um, with perhaps a Pictish foundation. Um, so there, there are a couple of sort of literary examples that I can think of that have multiple people who I would argue seem to be travellers from Northern Britain to, to Ireland, but there, there's certainly a lot. Um, you, you get the sense when you look through a lot of the, the earliest sources that it is far from being the, uh, the one-way movement of people that's uh, often kind of popularly imagined nowadays. There's certainly a, a, a very nice cluster of um, early sculpture around the Bankery Tiernan along that stretch of the, 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 the D um, with incredibly strong um, Iona connections, parallels. Um, so, you know, it certainly shows a, a sort of, um, I think, a very active um, a sort of a settlement um, evangelization of that part of Pickland um, with the, um, the Scottish, uh, and for that we might be able to say Irish church. Um, you know, in the 7th, 8th century, something like that. Anybody got any questions, please wave a hand. Oh, right. Um, Barbara. Can you see me? Oh, oh, right. Hang on a second, Kelly. Um, Barbara's waving a hand. So, Barbara, you go first, and then I'll get Kelly afterwards. Barbara, are you going to unmute yourself? Right, okay, yes. Um, just just a quick observation. Uh, there's a St. Fergus's well in in Glams, and the St. Fergus seems to be an early saint or early churchman associated with Glams. And there's a Droston's Cross near Tarfside in Glenesk, which is uh, marked on a stone that is that's supposed to mark the, the, the site of a very early church there. So I don't know whether perhaps these are the Fergus and Droston that you mentioned. It's, I mean, it's, it is certainly very plausible, very plausible that, I mean, at the very least they're commemorating the same, the same men. Um, the difficulty with both Fergus and Droston um, is charting exactly where any historical individuals might have been active. I suppose the, the, best candidate, I would say, would be Deer, that, that Adroston was associated with Deer at an early time, and then was associated with travel to Ireland. But there's no telling. I mean, that, that, that's, that in itself has got a large amount of, uh, of uh, inference in it. Um, but it's, yeah, it's certainly the case that both Drosten and Fergus were very widely commemorated um, throughout the Northeast, but also in Caithness as well. Okay, Kelly, would you like to yeah, unmute myself? Okay, oh, thank you, Oshin. That was um, that was an excellent talk. Um, I just had a few questions about um, some of the personal names. So I can see how, you know, Droscan is, you know, is, is, is Droston, you know, C and T are, are quite commonly confused as scribal errors. Um, but I noticed you said that we might never get to the bottom of Mohulian. But um, I wonder if that's actually the Britonic personal name, Coulomb, um, just usually spelled. There's a saint in Cornwall and there's a saint in Brittany, and I think one in Wales as well, um, who in the earliest records, his name is spelled C-U-L-A-N. And he, the saint's name ends up becoming spelled C-O-L-E-N or C-O-L-A-N. And I wonder if it might be the Pictish equivalent of, of that um, Britonic saint's name. And um, I think the other name that I was wondering about is um, uh, um, a three in Oc. Um, I know you mentioned the um, name Tranon uh, from the life of St. Columba, and um, I had to go and check the source. <laughs> but I think, yeah, Adamnon, um, he, he just put, you know, the Latin ending on it, um, Trenonus. Um, but I wondered if, if it might not be that name, but but three and ok, or mochri and ok, um, contains that ok uh, suffix, which you find in Britonic personal names in Wales, Cornwall, and it wouldn't really be surprising if you found it in Pickland as well. I, I can't think 
off the top of my head of a Pictish king's name with that with that um, with that suffix ending. Um, but it's quite common in place names in Scotland uh, as well. So um, I don't know. I think these are probably I don't know more 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 comments rather than questions um, or observations. But um, I don't know. Those were just some of the thoughts I had. And um, no, I thought it was uh, it was also just really great to just see you know medieval Irish interests in, in pigs who came over to Ireland as well. So um, um, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to say mention those things and to tell you thank you. Well, thank you very much for both of those. And um, they're, they're they're fascinating. Um, things that I'll look into definitely because uh, yeah, um, yeah, it would be be nice if we, if we could see a bit more about Mohuli and 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 that sounds incredibly plausible um, because I think given that the poem is clearly overtly moving people from Scotland to Ireland mm. and a very large number of the subjects of the poem seem to at least comfortably have people of that name who are associated with Northern Britain then I, yes, I, it would be unsurprising. Yeah. It it's, I mean, it struck me that all the names, like yeah. oh, sorry, yes, carry oh, on. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was about to say, it struck me that all the names in, in the poem are Britonic names, you know, they're names that you might expect to find in, you know, in, in Britain as opposed to Ireland. So you might think with some of these other names that they're a bit hard to sort of um, identify. Um, I think it's trying to sort of they're presumably Britonic names that have been spelled in, in Gaelic. So the spelling might have changed a bit, but it might be able to find parallels with um, Welsh and Cornish personal names, um, particularly since with the, with the picks, we have the King's List and then a few inscriptions. And then beyond that, it's we're looking at place names and and saint uh, and, and sort of cult dedications. Um, but those have obviously been changed quite a lot over the years. So they're a bit difficult, but um, but yes no that that is that is fantastic thank you very much and okay I'll yes thank you look into them thank you okay thank you any other questions wave a hand oh um peter uh sorry ian mcclair has uh said have you any opinion on the name can cardinal neil um and See if I, I think I've lost the end of that. Uh, Concurrent O'Neill and Professor Watson's comment that that parish borders on Bankery Tiernan. Yes, that's interesting. I have certainly seen that um, referred to um, as a possible, I mean, that would be an overt link between potentially the e nail and the, uh, and um, as portrayed in the poem, and a place that's uh, yeah, associated with Tiernan. Um, I don't, to be honest, know the history of where that name come from. Came from an O'Neill, and if it's if it's the if it's referring to the later O'Neill, or if it's referring to the the E nail, um, I don't know if anybody has more information on that. But yeah, that would certainly be interesting. I suppose the difficulty with drawing conclusions with anything that references the E nail is just how. Uh, huge the reach of the e nail are in ireland and and it's and and i mean there there are so many branches that it's sometimes quite it would be quite hard to say ah well that's clearly a link with this particular branch of the e nail or this particular um this particular cult but it's certainly it's certainly interesting um i don't i don't know if, if the question or anyone else has any knows any of the history of, of where o'neill comes from do you want to come back on that ian well, I mean, I have Watson in front of me, and it's actually in a note at the at the rear under his additional notes. Um, and he, he talks about the last quartering of the poem, but he, he also talks about, um, it appears as the name of the district in 1200 in the Register of Aberdeen. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. That is early then. That is early. And, and I mean... What that means in practice is any any guess, I suppose. But I mean, you, I mean, perhaps we can speculate that there's some sort of patronage going on and some sort of connection, perhaps, between the patronage that's being espoused in this poem for Ireland and and Leinster and and the similar and the same saint as one of these who's been who's being uh, um, clearly commemorated in in Bankery. So 
it's certainly possible. And again, I would just be fascinated to try and pin down again when this thing was written, when this poem was written, and what was happening at the time, and, and if there was a time that you could fit, um, that would fit quite nicely politically um, with what's going on in the sort of Meath and Leinster with the e -nail, um, that would at least lend itself to somebody trying to claim that all these places were within the within e -nail territory. But yeah, uh, a fascinating thing to to speculate on again. Any more questions from anybody? Wave a hand or send a type. Oh, here we go. Um, Lily's typed one. I'll get back to you in a minute, Graham. I'm just going to read out one that's arrived here. Uh, okay, Lily has asked, um, there is an Irish poem translated to uh, the destruction of the Dargis host, Hostel, um, which references three Pictish warriors who went into exile out of their country. Do you happen to know if this poem was contemporary to the one that you have addressed? Um, I'm afraid I don't know the chronology of the, the Dergis Hostel. I, I don't know if any, there's any Irish literary experts out there that might be able to help. I do, I, I will say though, um, that it's, it's very interesting that yes, in the secular world as well, there seems to be quite the phenomenon of Pictish secular figures who um, who uh, leave Pictish territory and go to Ireland. Um, for example, we have a, 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 a Bride who's exiled in, in Tory Island off the coast, coast of Donegal. We've got a Taran who's exiled um, from Pictish Kingdom, seems to be, um, given the hints that we have from Adamran's work, uh, resident for a time in Iona, perhaps, and then exiled to Ireland. It seems to be quite a popular place. And I don't know if it's just the perfect balance between it's close enough to Pictish territory that people could exist reasonably well within a society that they would know, um, but it's far enough away to, for the most part, get out of bother. But I do wonder if, um, yeah, it's interesting you're saying about that, that, that literary reference to the Pictish warriors. Um, it may well be be that it was a known phenomenon that people would would exile themselves from from Ireland to uh, sorry from Pictish territory to Ireland um, and vice versa one would assume as well but uh, no that is interesting and I, I don't know I will defer to anyone who knows the chronology of the destruction of the Dergis Hostel. Okay uh, Graham you were waving a, waving a hand. I hope um, I should have forgive me if I ask a question not on the talk you gave tonight, uh, but with your background, you might just know this. In these um, lockdown times, we're getting a lot of repeats on television of historical series, mostly very good ones, so it's quite nice to see them again. Neil Oliver has been featuring quite mm -hmm. a bit, and he had a rerun there of his series on the Vikings. And I took down a wee quote that got me curious. In the year 871, 260 ships arrived in Dublin packed with slaves, Britons, Angles, and Picts, and buyers came from all over Europe. Now, normally I would pop out to the National Library, which is only a quarter of an hour from me, and look up the Annals of Ulster, Annals of Tiger Nass, Sub Anno 871, but I don't have that facility available. Do you recognize that quote? I see you rushing to get <laughs> a volume off your shelf there. I'd be interested to know uh, what was going on. Well, whilst she's, um, looking just, that up, I'll, I'll, whilst she's looking that one up, I'll say that you you can find the annals online, even when you can't get access to it in the in the National Library, you'll, you'll find it online. Ah. Right, go for it, Oshin. Uh, yes, I mean, I... I... I don't know that I can necessarily say anything more than it's a yet clearly massive spoils of plunder, battle, lots of people taken. Um, yeah, uh, Ablive and Ivar uh, returned to Dublin from Alaba with two, 200 ships, bringing away with them in captivity to Ireland a great prey of Angles and Britons and Picts. Um, those two, Ablive and Ivar, were 
pretty good at going, fighting people, taking prisoners and uh, transporting them. Um, they, they were quite notorious and quite, um, yeah, ran uh, roughshod over quite a lot of territory. Um, so I would say it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly, it, 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 it just shows you the extent to which with the coming of the Norse in particular, but obviously enslavement um, very much predates that. But uh, there was an awful lot of um, um, non-voluntary migration as well, um, and it's uh, it's uh, certainly something that uh, that's uh, that's a major factor. I mean, a uh, good example of that, not Pictish though, but would be uh, Adhavnan, um who seemingly negotiated the return of various captives that uh, Northumbria had taken from Ireland and negotiated the repatriation of them. Um, so it's, uh, it was certainly for a long, long time, even before the Norse, it was uh, quite a significant, uh, I suppose, tactic to take take people caught in battle um, and, uh, and enslave them, um, either to have as slaves or sometimes um, for obviously political machinations. But... Uh, yeah. Um, so yes, it's it it's uh, it just shows you the extent to which the Picts, both for the positive and negative sort of aspects of of life, were very much embroiled in all of the the goings on of the British Isles as much as anybody else was. Thank you. Right. If one last question, if anybody wants to wave a hand, nobody. Oh, yeah. Okay, Peter, unmute yourself and. Ask your, your question that you, you typed a minute ago. Go for it. Yes, done it. Um, yep. Did I hear a passing reference to uh, name uh, Ukulean? Something like that. You thinking of Kukulean? How do you pronounce these things? You thinking of Kukulean? Well, possibly, yes. I, I, I heard it, it, it was a quick reference to a name, yeah. Uh, Mokulean, yes. He's one, of the, he's one of the brothers. So he's the one that... Um, Oh God! He's one of the ones that were um, that, as I said, there's there's little that can be said about him. Although um, it's been helpfully pointed out that it's perhaps could be could be referred or could be um, connected to the the Brythonic name Cullen. Um But I think I, th I would say Mokulian is probably the closest person I've described right. to that name that you've said there. Right. Okay. That that that's very interesting because. Uh, I, I keep chasing names that have dog connections. Uh, that is particularly relevant to where I live. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, Kilmadoc uh, is, is the parish name, and we have a saint who is given, uh, everybody seems agreed these days, that it's Church of My Doc, and the question is, who was Doc? We do have a history of the dog family in the village, um, very extensively, and a stone that is marked as being the property of Ukulian. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the, two, the names keep crossing one another, rightly, wrongly, as fantasy or not, I've no idea, but it's these connections that I keep looking for to try to find out who the heck was Doc. <laughs> well, well, we'll keep asking. Thank Maybe you. Maybe we'll find somebody who knows. Right, I think that's probably um, put a sheen through the ringer um, enough for one evening. So um, thank you very much for um, a splendid and fascinating talk. Uh, absolutely brilliant to see, um, as you say, uh, such a, well, I thought it was a relatively short poem, but actually making a, a, a gold mine of um, uh, historical references um, for uh, this period. So thank you, and I wish you all the best up there in Orkney, and uh, roll on the end of lockdown, and um, so we can um, get back together again, and we'll, we'll maybe see you soon at a, at a conference or something. Um, it was great seeing so many of you um, at last weekend's conference. Um, we ended up with a whopping 235 people um, uh, logging on in total, which was uh, quite splendid. Um, uh, and it has certainly made me feel a lot more confident 
uh, that this year's um, Pictish Arts Society Conference will be an online event, probably following a very similar format to the Cornerstone Conference, um, based over two um, consecutive uh, Friday Saturday afternoons. Um, and I think the format worked well, and hopefully we'll, we'll get a good turnout for that. Um, our speaker in April is going to be Dr. Benjamin Hudson, and he's going to be telling us about uh, the intellectual background to the sculptured stones. So that sounds like a fascinating thing. He, he is an American academic, so he's going to be joining us from the States. We're going to be putting... Um, time zones and uh, Zoom technology, testing it to the limits, um, but I'm sure it will work fine. So hopefully we will see you all then. That is on Friday, the 16th of April. Until then, stay well, stay safe and good night. Thanks again, Oshin. <laughs>